Take three. Here's number 17 on the final exam. One of the guys here wanted me to answer this. And the question is, which of the following molecules is nonpolar? So what does that mean? Well, that means basically, let's say we have a trigonal planar molecule over here. Okay. So all of these terminal atoms, you see three of them here are the exact same one. And let's say that, yeah, and obviously they'll all have the same electronegativity. I'm sure there are some, some, uh, some exceptions to that, but for now we're in Gen Chem 1, so please don't worry about that, okay? But all of these will be pulling away electrons that are contained within this bond with roughly the same amount of force because they're all the same, okay? And likewise, we don't have any lone pairs here interfering with our angles or anything like that. So you can say, you know, that this is relatively nonpolar if these are all the same. Adam, there are no lone pairs, okay? So working with those two stipulations, let's start, okay? So here's IF3, all right? Let's draw out the Lewis structure in order to find out if it's nonpolar. So keep in mind, the first, you know, if we do see that these are all the same, atom around, then, you know, you need to then find out if you have a lone pair there. If you have both of those fulfilled, well, then chances are you've got something nonpolar. Over here we have IF3. Now we have three Fs surrounding that I. So we know the first part is fulfilled, that we all have the same, um, same type of element surrounding this central over here. But if we work this out, we have 28 total valence electrons. We subtract six for the three bonds here. We get our 22 valence electrons. Now the Fs can have 18 total, okay? And so the four remaining go on that iodine. So what you have then is five electron domains, which would have created not this, sorry, that's for something else, but it would have created something kind of like this, I guess. Um, this is actually referred to as your trigonal bipyramidal, okay? And uh, I'm an awful artist, so just deal with it. And so what you have kind of are, are, oh wow, that's awful. But what you have basically is this axial, okay, and you can imagine that these three are kind of rotating around this stick, all right? That, that's how I've always thought of it. But the thing is that we replaced two of these arms with lone pairs. So what we have is this instead, okay? So what we'll see then is we have this force going up, let's say, and this force going up, all right? But then we have this force going here, all right? We have nothing, we, we have nothing going on here. Nothing is pulling in the opposite direction of this one. So unfortunately, this is not, this is, sorry, this is very, very polar, okay? This is polar. Uh, an analogy I like to use is imagine a stick in the ground, okay? So you have a stick in the ground, and let's, let's just do it for something like a trigonal planar, like over here. So imagine that this is a stick or a stake in the ground, okay? You have three people, they're all clones of one another, all right? And they all have a rope tied to that center stick. If they all pull kind of outwards away from that stick, you can imagine that their forces will cancel out and that stick will not move, okay? That kind of is the definite, you know, that, that kind of entails uh, non-polarity in, in an atom. If you had something 3D like a tetrahedral, okay, so let me try to draw a tetrahedral while staring at a screen. I'm going to be awful at this. But just imagine that this is, that that center... Um, that that center atom here is just a, a ball maybe suspended in the air. And you've got three people down here, all of equal strength, and you've got a helicopter up here maybe with that, that's exerting the same strength that any one of these people would have, okay? And what you'd see is all of them would cancel each other out. They'd all be pulling outwards, and that their forces would be canceled out, and this center part over here would just stay levitating in the air, would never move. So that's a, a, another useful um, way of thinking about about it. So let's move on. Okay, so we know that this is polar. So here's B, here's IF5. So we're going to do this. We have 42 valence electrons from the five fluorines here and the one iodine or iodine, iodine. Oh my gosh, I, I'm terrible with this one here. Okay, and we get basically 42 total electrons. We'll subtract 10 for the five bonds because you have two electrons per bond and you get 32. So I'll place these down. Now all the Fs can only accommodate uh, sorry, 30 electrons. Why? Because you have six per, okay? You have two of them taken care of by the bond. So you're left with two electrons left over. That's going to be a lone pair on iodine. And so we do know that we have, you know, the same number, sorry, the same type of element surrounding, but we now have a lone pair. So we need to draw, well, we always need to draw the structure, but let's take a look at it on a molecular level. What you should have had is something with six 
electron domains, right? Because we have five bonds, we have one lone pair, and it should have looked like an octahedral, kind of like this, right? But we don't have that. We have a lone pair, and the lone pair takes the place of one of these arms, and you'll have this. You'll have a, a square pyramidal. Do you see how that's a pyramid, all right? And so is this polar or is this nonpolar? Well, these four over here will cancel each other out because they're going in opposite directions, okay? They're all exerting the same relative direction from the central atom. But this top one here that's pulling up, all right, it's not being counteracted by a force over here, okay? We've got four guys here, we've got that helicopter, and the helicopter is just going to lift everyone up because there's no force pulling it downwards. All right, so this is also polar. I'm going to try to shoot through the rest of these. Uh, SO3, so here we have our, our sulfur in the middle because it's the least electronegative, and it's attached to three oxygens by, a, a, well, I, I have to put in a double bond eventually. But anyway, we have 24 total valence electrons. We'll take away six for each of these bonds. We're left with 18 valence electrons, okay? So in this case, we'll put six on this one, six on this one, six on this one, because they each need eight total, and you have two from that bond, all right? But then we have a problem. We have a problem with the sulfur. Now, some of the people I've seen that talk, you know, that were talking to me, they said that this is a little bit difficult to understand in terms of why this one is nonpolar. Answer has been given away, all right? And, and it goes like this. Well, yes, we're going to have to have a double bond somewhere in order to accommodate the, uh, the octet rule for sulfur, okay? But... In doing that, we change the bond length, but we don't change the force that's being exerted away. Okay, now O is more electronegative than sulfur. So you'll see these forces. I just want you to use your imagination, as you young kids are good at doing, and, and, and just imagine these are all the same <laughs> length arrow. And you can still see that despite the fact that you have a double bond here, you're still exerting the same amount of, uh, of electronegativity on the electrons. Okay, these electrons are going to get closer to the oxygen than the sulfur, all right? Uh, it's going to be the same all around. We also don't have any lone pair. So this pretty much tells us, yes, in fact, this is nonpolar. But let's keep going, all right? Here we have H CHCl3. Now, for me, this is kind of a deal breaker in that when I draw my Lewis structure, I have three chlorines here, but I have one hydrogen. And hydrogen is not going to actually exert the same kind of electronegative behavior as these three chlorines. These chlorines are going to be stealing from the carbon, okay, stealing electron, well, not really stealing, but pulling them closer to the chlorine than the carbon. But this hydrogen is actually less electronegative, so I believe, um, than this carbon. And so the carbon will actually be pulling electrons in towards it using the hydrogen. And so what we have are these two chlorines here will cancel each other out here. But this chlorine is going to exert a larger, uh, is basically going to be pulling this way and the hydrogen is going to be following suit. Imagine again that this is a, a stake in the ground. If you have this guy pulling this way, this guy pulling this way, all right, and they're, let's say these two are like muscle men that you would see on TV. Here's another muscle man here, and here's kind of a, a small little dog tied on a rope to the stick that's just being dragged along with it, okay? And even worse, the dog is moving in the same direction, all right? So you can imagine that that stake will just start moving that way, all right? So that is polar. And then finally, we have NH3, and this is ammonium, of course. Um, not, not, oh, sorry, ammonia, not ammonium, <laughs> of course. All right. So anyway, we have our center nitrogen, because nitrogen is going to be, well, you're never going to have a center uh, atom of hydrogen, because hydrogen can only produce one bond, okay? Nitrogen can produce uh, three bonds, all right? Um, actually, that's a lie. But anyway, moving on, let's just know that hydrogen is never in the middle. So, I, yeah, I said that incorrectly. So let's look at this. We have eight total valence electrons. We're going to take away six for the three bonds. We have two left over. We have a lone pair here. So let's draw it out because, you know, there, there are cases where you will have lone pairs and it will still be polar, all right? So let's look at this. So we have four electron domains, so it should be a tetrahedral. Yes, I'm a regular Picasso right here, all right? But... Now that you have a lone pair, well, one of them is actually going to turn into a lone pair, as opposed to being an arm with a terminal atom on it. And it'll choose particularly this one over here, all right? Because you see, this angle here is actually less, or no, hold on, sorry, that, you know, these are relatively, oh, no. Okay, you know what? It doesn't even matter. It can replace any of these, okay? But what you need to realize is that when you replace one of them, you have three left over. And you can kind of imagine that this is like a pyramid on the bottom, sorry, a, a triangle on the bottom and a pyramid up top. And so what you have total here is you have your, 
this is your trigonal pyramidal, okay? Uh, and as you can see here, we have this force going down, this force going down. This Actually, it's, these are going in, 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 right? But they're all not getting canceled out by another force going in this way, okay? So if you were to have all these guys pushing in this way, okay, imagine the stake kind of thing going on again, you can imagine that this thing's actually moving up because we have no force that's pushing it back down, okay? So in that case, this is actually polar. So some things I'd like to say, um, if you can lay something flat on the ground, if, for example, you had, you know, you had a... a Let's say my hand was this atom, okay, and let's pretend like my fingers were all around it like an octopus, okay? If you can, if all the arms were the same atom and you were to place it down on a table, if it could lay flat on a table, chances are it is nonpolar, okay? So your trigonal uh, planar over here, okay, you have three of the same atom. It sits on the table. They're all going, you know, in relatively the same direction from the central atom. Well, then you're going to have it be nonpolar. Okay. Uh, of course, the tetrahedral doesn't work for this because it doesn't lay flat. But for me, you know, it's just a useful analogy. It doesn't work 100% of the time. But in terms of thinking, you know, if I have the same atom and I have no lone pairs, if it lays flat on the table, chances are it is going to be nonpolar.